All right, so uh, yeah, tonight, tonight we are continuing our series on uh, community conservation conversations. So we've heard from Waterways and the South Chickamauga Greenway Alliance, and we've heard from National Parks Legacy Program. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce David Johnson as the Trust for Public Lands Program Director for the Chattanooga area. Uh, so David was a lot of fun to work with um, back when he was in the City Parks Division, and I'm so glad that we still get to work together now through the Trust for Public Lands. Um, a lot of people may not realize how many um, places and just uh, treasured green spaces around the city are, are really possible because of the Trust for Public Lands, and I kind of continue to discover the, the great work they've done in the past. So. Um, so let me hand it over to David uh, so we can hear about some past projects and uh, plans for the future. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. That was a great introduction. Um, it's late in the day, so I'm going to try to keep my energy high. Um, <laughs> my name is David Johnson. I work with the Trust for Public Lands. been with them for a few years, and before that, I was, with, I was the Assistant Director of Parks for the City of Chattanooga. As you can see on the screen, um, you can see our mission, which is to create parks, protect land, for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities for generations to come. Um, and then our vision is one where everybody's close to nature. Um, we're quite a bit different from several of the organizations you've heard from before. We're also not a traditional land uh, conservancy. We don't hold land. Um, so we do a lot of different things. And I've, I've put together this presentation hopefully so you understand and get excited about all the different things that are happening across the country, but also how um, you can think about ways we can bring these ideas back to our city, back to our region, and see some of these things happen here. Um, so I'm gonna run through this kind of- Hey, uh, David, you got muted there just for a second. I did, sorry about that. I'm trying to see if I can, there we go. So here's some pictures of some different projects we've worked on across the country. Um, we do all kinds of projects, all scales. We work at this, which we call the landscape scale, um, where you know it's a, it's a large body. It has its own topography. It has its own natural features, and we help conserve all of it. Then we work in very urban environments like uh, this um, you know, riverfront in New Jersey. This is very, I've, as you can see, very similar to our river walk. Um, we work in the inner city of New York and other Northeast cities where we take basically asphalt lots that the, the schools use for their play space. And then we work with the, the students to transform them into beautiful places that aren't only safe and fun for recreation, but they're also providing, you know, um, ecological benefits, environmental, environmental benefits. This is closer to us. This is in Georgia and Atlanta. Um, this park is not only a great and beautiful space, but it also provides um, some water quality benefits. It acts as a basically a stormwater storage device during uh, heavy precipitation. We work on the, you know, similar to our rivers here, the Chattahoochee uh, Blue Way in Georgia, where we try to create access to rivers and, the, and creeks work on urban projects again, like the Beltline in Atlanta to help conserve and buy properties there. And this slide shows you um, our, our strategic plan. So this is a new information. Um, it, it shows on the left side what we do. You can see we do lands, we do parks, we do schoolyards and we do trails. On the right side, you can see, you know, how we do some of our work. So, you know, whether it's protecting land or doing, you know, geospatial analysis. Um, we have a lot of different tools that we use that all come back to being um, very responsive to the communities we're working in. And then the middle shows why we do these things. You know, why, why do we do all these different activities? They're for communities. Um, all our work um, focuses on the people that get benefits from public spaces, whether those are very natural um, like you saw in some of those slides earlier, you know, how people can access those places and get those benefits 
or very built environments like those in urban environments where we're trying to improve some of those public spaces so they're being more dynamic and people are benefiting more from those spaces. So um, that's a, a very quick overview of kind of our national work. Um, if anybody has any questions or concerns, um, you can either one, unmute yourself and ask them, or you could reach out to me uh, after this. I can share all this information. Um, this is one of the things we do. We really advocate for our work um, nationally. So here's uh, some of the pictures of our city from um, you know quite a bit ago. Um, I won't get into the history of that. Many of you know you know our our industrial history um, and how it's at one point city leaders said we we need something different. We've got to imagine a different kind of city um, in order. To, to move forward um, and to have a brighter future. And we've you know, been able, been successful to see that. So here's some of the great public spaces that get you know, shown on all the, all the magazines, all the newspapers. Um, Chattanooga has a, a good reputation nationally as being an outdoor town. Um, be, being a um, kind of an example of how a city can transform itself. It can change its character um, from a very, you know, dirty place um, to a place that's very welcoming and very beautiful and um, you know just a nice place to go and visit and live. Um, here is um, kind of a list of our work. Um, some of you may are very likely familiar with these. Um, they include the river park where we assist the city and the county in acquiring properties. Um, Stringers Ridge is kind of our notable um, project here in the region um, where we help conserve and build trails on this uh, ridge that's uh, you know kind of a, a view for the city but more recently we've worked on things like fitness uh, equipment um, and playgrounds kind of reimagining public spaces um, as well we rely a lot on private philanthropy so we help the city to raise funds for public amenities so that um, you know they can get those benefits um, we, we are often included in um, public-private partnerships where you, where you have private development and city government, and we try to come in and find ways to find mutually beneficial agreements. Um, you know, how, how can developers and the city get positive things for residents here? And here's some of the pictures of those projects. Here's Stringers Ridge. And here's the river walk, which will be extended into St. Elmo a little bit later this year. Uh, more recently, um, we've started construction on um, a section of South Chickamauga Creek Greenway. It's uh, shown on that map. It's between miles five and mile six. This is kind of the, the middle, most difficult, most challenging mile of the greenway. Um, and, and once these uh, three remaining miles are completed, probably early next year, you'll be able to go from the Riverwalk all the way to Camp Jordan and East Ridge without having to get um, onto, onto vehicular roads. Um, almost all of this is completely separated from traffic. Um, so this is made for people of all abilities, whether you're a runner, walker, biker, someone using, utilizing a mobility device, uh, if you have a stroller, if you have a, a dog or a, another pet, uh, it's made for everybody. Uh, and that's kind of the hallmark of our work here is how can we make places where everybody can come and enjoy. Here's some of the pictures of uh, the creek. That was quite a bit ago. Um, this is the bridge that crosses over into Camp Jordan, probably right when it was finished. Uh, that was in the 1990s. This is our work to bring in a, a bridge. It was barged up before it was moved into place to cross the creek. This is a picture of our typical construction on South Chickamauga Creek. Um, this is fully accessible. Oh, skipped over. Paddlers. And then um, picture of a family just being able to um, enjoy the greenway. And then um, as part of the South Chicken Margaret Creek Greenway, we worked on um, an environmental art piece by Adam Kuby. This is at Sturkey Farm. 
it's meant to kind of represent and allow um, people of all ages to kind of experience the different environments here. I love this picture because that's my kid. His name's Felix. So he's inspecting this boulder uh, for defects, I guess. I don't know. And then here's a, a pavilion that we constructed to replace the, the dairy barn that had been burned several times and wasn't really safe for public use. More pictures of the Greenway. Sorry, I included quite a bit of those. So um, that was a very quick overview of several of our projects, not all of them. So, because we've worked with lots of different organizations locally to do lots of different things, protect a lot of different land, open up space for people. But all of it comes down to how can we have places close to where people live where they can go and, and get connected to nature. Um, and this is where, you know, our, our mission, what we do um, intersects with um, wild ones and what you do um, on a regular basis, which is you understand the value of, um, you know, plants and animals and natural environments to people. Um, we try to find ways to, to introduce people to some of those benefits in a safe way where they don't feel like they're, you know, they're really having to get uncomfortable. Um, we try to introduce them in a very comfortable way so that, you know, they can, they can start to do more. Um, you know, we, we typically don't, don't focus on um, the very um, trained user groups, right? So we're, we um, are not developing um, spaces for just a small group of people. Ours are really to be enjoyed by everybody. And that's, a, that's a, another reason how we, you know, separate ourselves from other organizations. Um, so, so locally, you know, that's come out in what we call a 10 minute walk campaign. Um, that's a goal to get a park within a 10 minute walk of every resident. Um, unfortunately in Chattanooga right now is about 37%, um, which is relatively low, but, but not too bad for the South. Um, it's a lot easier when you're in an urban environment, you know, like in the Northeast, um, your, your cities are usually constrained. Um, but here in the South, our cities continue to grow. And so it's more difficult to reach everybody. Um, but our work is really focused on finding places close to home that can be developed into parks so that um, people can go there every day. Um, we want parks and public spaces to be um, used as often as possible so that those benefits come to people. Um, yeah, so this is a, a campaign that we have, have been working on for several years. Mayor Burke was one of the first mayors to sign on to this. Um, and, and we continue to work with the city to um, help this vision come to life. We also focus really strongly on community engagement, working with residents who are there to understand what, what they want their parks to do for them. Um, you know, we, we don't, there, there are lots of different ways that parks help uh, people, especially in urban environments, but it's not just for recreation. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but parks provide all kinds of things for people. They um, help cool the city down. They help absorb water. They um, provide safe spaces for communities to come together and share and, um, you know, create that cohesiveness that a lot of times we lack in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, they obviously can make us healthier, especially when we use them very often, um, which is a goal of ours more, more recently. Um, and they can be used to create, you know, to show off beautiful pieces of culture, um, like this park in California. And here's our uh, great logo. So what I'd love to do is stop right here because I've talked a lot and I would love to hear any questions um, anyone has about our work um, locally, you know, what we've done historically or what we're doing right now. Great. Yeah. If we could take a little break. Um, there aren't any questions that I can see in the chat box right now. Um, but if if anyone wants to type, okay, so we got one from Lisa here. 
um, how can we integrate wildlife, big or small, into our urban parks? Yeah, that's a great question. Lynn is definitely more qualified to answer that question than I am. So um, <laughs> that's something that we're, we're thinking about more often. Um, there's no easy answer, but I can tell you that our approach to park development is to make them as sustainable as possible and sustainable in a lot of different ways. So what I think about coming from a maintenance background is how can we create places that require as few inputs as possible, but still be beautiful and enjoyable and welcoming. And a lot of times that is native plants. Um, you know, whenever I look at plans that show irrigation, I think I really don't want a plant that needs to get watered. Like I want something that, you know, once it gets established, it's just going to be there. It's going to get larger. It's going to grow. Um, we try to support and focus on planting trees in a lot of our projects because a tree, unlike a lot of other things in government, is an actual investment. Every year it provides more and more value, right? So it gets bigger. It absorbs uh, more carbon, it provides more shade, it absorbs more storm water, like you're getting more benefits every year um, until the point that it, that it dies. And even then it's, it's holding carbon. Um, and so what we want to do is focus on designs of park and greenway projects that incorporate native plants so that they require very little maintenance um, and more of a management approach. Uh, where it's not something you have to go every week and do a set routine, but you just have to monitor the site and try to support it more and more. Yeah, that's great. And I, I feel like you guys also just conserve spaces that are already great habitat and just need to be protected also. Um, so yeah, the care of the land and then also just what's already present sometimes is, mm -hmm. is golden. Um, so we got a lot of questions rolling in now. Um, so just one clarification, what, how big is the area that, that your office covers? So we're locally, we're the Tennessee office. So we're anywhere okay. in the state and even then some in kind of North Georgia. Um, but we've had such a good relationship with the city of Chattanooga that that's where most of our projects, um, happen to be. Um, we get, um, uh, an annual, um, fund from the city to basically do this land protection work um, and we a lot of that a lot of times we help bring in private money that is you know probably 10 times as much as we receive um, so I focus specifically on Chattanooga we have such a great um, philanthropy community here they support all this work they want to see Chattanooga grow and get better and they're willing to, to put funds into that. And so we're going to continue to do that um, because it is such a great environment. It's um, the people here uh, really deserve to see, you know, more benefit. And again, I'll, I'll say this, you know, the, the 10 minute walk score for Chattanooga is 37%. That, that leaves a lot to be done. And so there's such a great need here to bring more communities, create more spaces for them. Um, you know, we talk about Chattanooga being a great outdoor place, and that, that is completely true, but there are a lot of neighborhoods that do not have access to the outdoors, and it's our goal to connect them or help bring nature close to their house. Fantastic. Well, so building on that, how would you say um, TPL has been received so far by, by the Chattanooga community? Uh, we, I think, have been received very well. We've, we've been in, the, in Chattanooga for um, over 25 years and had strong support from, um, you know, private individuals, philanthropy, city government, um, you know, every, you know, new politician that gets elected, we try to connect with them and, you know, again, share like I just did who we are and what we bring to the table. But generally, people are supportive of this work because they understand that, that great public spaces really make communities better. It makes the city um, more of a destination. Um, and it also has all these different ways that it impacts people that are tough to quantify, but are easy to understand. Great. Um, <clears throat> so we got a couple more questions and just let me know if you wanna move on at any point. Um, uh, folks want to know that uh, 
well, they, yeah, they want some more information about the South Chick Greenway. Sure. Um, when is it scheduled to be completed and will it make it to Catoosa County, Georgia? Wow. Um, so the, the Greenway is a private public partnership between us and CDOT. We're working to complete one mile. CDOT's doing two other miles. Um, we expect that to be finished early next year. Uh, that's what we're working towards, um, but we have to work with TDOT, and they haven't been um, as helpful as possible. That's what I thought, but <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. But then I was like, but that's East Ridge is outside of that. Um, we got a few people jumping on that might, if we could get muted real quick, so we don't get confused. Um, sorry about that. Um, sure. We're going to keep working to extend the greenway. So, you know, after we finish kind of the main line, our next goal is to say, well, what are the other places that could get connected in? You know, where are their neighborhoods that are really close, but they don't have easy access? Um, at the same time, looking at future expansion of it. So, you know, there, there are numerous ideas for um, regional trail systems that connect in uh, different municipality, municipalities to each other. Um, that make our, our region um, more navigable if you don't have a car. Um, we support that. We're going to continue to look for those things. Uh, we could not provide a timeline for, um, you know, completing, um, going all the way to Catoosa County, but we're working on it. Great. Well, I've got um, a couple more questions I'm going to merge together. I hope it's okay if I take this liberty, folks. Um, I was going to say, um, so we got some comments saying, wondering how much say you have when working with partners in uh, the use of native plants and trees versus easy ornamentals. And then that kind of ties to another question, which was that in places, um, the river walk feels kind of barren and maybe there's been some plant loss, not as many natives used as there could have been. Um, so yeah, I guess that's just a question sure. about how much say TPL has in that kind of decision. Yeah, in, in that situation on the Riverwalk, we have very little to no input on that. We had a very specific role in that project, which is just to acquire the property. Um, and the Riverwalk has an aesthetic that they're trying to maintain. I do know that over time they have shifted that some. They obviously take out plants that they found are invasive that are on those lists. Um, and more and more the city um, and planners want to incorporate native plants, not just because, you know, they're more suited to this region, but because they're easier to take care of and they have better longevity here. Um, on projects like South Chick, um, the ones that we construct, we have, you know, control of that. And so in those areas where we're disturbing ground and we have to seed, we're going back with a native uh, seed mix um, from Roundstone. Um, we're trying to incorporate more and more of that into our work um, whenever possible. So um, it, de it depends on our role in the project. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> this might be a great segue. How do you work with underserved communities uh, such as minorities and low income folks <clears throat> to help them develop parks and green spaces? That is a great question. Um, and, and that's related to a lot more of our work in South Chattanooga. Um, we uh, hired Daniela Peterson. Some of you may know her. She was previously with CNE. She is our um, creative placemaking um, person. I forget what her official title is, but she's, she's a community uh, liaison. She works really closely with um, the communities of Alton Park, Clifton Hills and Eastlake, uh, and has been since she worked with us. Um, she tries to establish strong partnerships with existing organizations in those neighborhoods, you know, organizations that are already trusted. So, you know, when we come into certain neighborhoods like minority neighborhoods, um, we, we look, you know, very similar to how many outdoor people look. We're, I'm, I'm a white man. And so obviously, you know, I have a, a specific understanding of the outdoors, but other communities that are more diverse have a very different um, understanding of the outdoors and it can be contentious at times. 
So that's a really complicated dynamic and we're understanding more of it every day, but a lot of it just um, is going into communities, um, trying to establish trust, trying to listen intently to a lot of the challenges they face um, and to better understand how our work can help support what they want in their community. Right. So we try not to go into a community and say, you need these three things, right? You need to be out hiking. Well, that, that's not our place to, to make, you know, that kind of statement. We go in and say, what are the challenges you're facing now? And how can some of the things we're doing help you live um, the life you want to? So it, it comes a, as a how we engage with people is um, listening first and trying to understand their history, their culture, um, and the different challenges they face. That's great. Well, yeah, um, Sally's mentioning that the Tree Commission got to work with Daniela mm -hmm. um, to host Arbor Day in Alton Park this past spring. Yep. Um, and folks want to know uh, how, how we can help um, TPL and you and Daniela uh, just in general. What um, what people can do. Sure. Um, you know, probably the toughest part of our work is having strong community advocates, people that, um, you know, they care a lot about the outdoors and about our work and they want to see more of it. Um, you know, especially with the crisis right now, crises that we're dealing with, there's so many challenges people face. And so, you know, not having access to a park is, is very far down the list of needs, right? They're worried about food, they're worried about housing, they're worried about healthcare and childcare. Um, and so, you know, when you have all these challenges, um, you know, the, the people who represent them really are trying to address those top challenges. Um, you know, that unfortunately for our organization, you know, we don't get into a lot of those realms. We don't deal with homelessness very often. We deal with parks and public space. Um, and so we try to take a very long-term approach and continue to say, continue to advocate for neighborhoods that don't have public spaces. Um, even though the benefits are really um, diverse, they're not always very tangible for people. And so we try to, you know, advocate for those things, not only with um, neighbors, but also with the people that represent them. So we, constantly are looking for people who can um, speak with their elected officials and promote um, not only our work, but talk about the different needs that their neighborhood has related to these issues. You know, how can, how can um, neighbors go and speak to their elected officials and say, you know, the, you know, certain neighborhoods have, neighborhoods have access to parks, but these don't, you know, what do we have to do to get new parks, new public spaces in places that don't have them now? Um, even when it's a challenge, even when it costs money up front and it costs money, um, you know, in perpetuity to maintain these public spaces, the community is better for them and they pay off more than they cost. Um, but we have to, we just need people to continue to prioritize these kind of um, projects, especially with uh, their elected officials. Yeah, so green spaces are definitely another way to invest in the community. Um, so talking to council members, elected officials about how you feel about green spaces. Um, that sounds great. Do you want to keep taking questions? Or, Tell you what, uh, let's, um, we'll shift. I'd love to talk about, you know, some of the ways that we use information to guide our, our work locally. Um, I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to see those because a lot of the information we provide is open to everybody. We want, you know, people to have access to information and use it to, you know, advocate for their own neighborhoods a lot of times. So I'm going to try to change what I'm sharing and show uh, a tool that we developed several years ago called Healthy Connected Chattanooga. I believe you can see the map now. Yep, looks this great. Is a, this is a map of obviously our city. Um, it's outlined in this dark black. Uh, that's why Red Bank is cut out. East Ridge is down here. And this is a, a GIS um, uh, system that's open for anyone to access. Um, it 
collects different layers of information that we use on a regular basis that tie to public space. And so there's a lot of data in here. It, it, you can spend a lot of time like I do looking through and seeing what are some of the different variables across the city. So we've collected all this information in a hopefully easy to use system and it's focused on priority areas. And so for us locally, just in Chattanooga, we have prioritize connectivity um, we prioritize um, cooling the environment, absorbing stormwater, um, equity, which was mentioned as, a, as a, an issue earlier, um, and then health. And those we call our, our results areas, so there's five main ones. Under each one, we collect a lot of different information. You can see on the left, there's, there's a lot of different layers here that you can view. You can turn them on and off, and I'll do that really quickly. But anyone can access this. Um, we can, I can share the link with you. Um, you just have to sign up for an account, but it's automatic. And so, in all these different layers, we have uh, information available. This one's uh, land surface temperature, which I'm trying to turn on. There we go. And you can see kind of a heat, it's a heat map of our city um, taken from satellites. This shows the hottest places of our city kind of in the urban core, and then cooler places around different natural features. You can see this is Missionary Ridge, this light blue area. So we have uh, layers here on cooling. We have um, various uh, information on, you know, different streams, uh, flood areas. You can see this, this bright purple area is Chattanooga Creek in South Chattanooga. Scroll down and we'll change some more information um, and we have other layers below as well. This is a lot of information, so you can get really overwhelmed. Uh, um, but what it does is this shows, um, this helps us understand different projects. So when we're, we get approached by different groups, different individuals, they want to park in their neighborhood. We say, well, let's try to understand, you know, is this, is this project in a high priority area for us? And so we take all this different information, um, and run some geospatial analysis and we can turn this on and it shows kind of a need across the city for where would um, urban parks provide the most benefits. And so when you turn all those different layers on, you get this um, different heat map of the city, which shows places where new parks could have the greatest benefit. And so you can, you can kind of see some of the areas we're talking about. Um, you know, this is around 23rd street. So you see a very, bright red spot here. This red is in East Chattanooga. So, you know, they have a lot of, um, you know, both environmental and um, health challenges there. You can also just look at one priority area if you wanted to. So let's see one that's fun. Health is, is you know, coming up more and more often, right? Um, uh, we have a lot of challenges related to community health. And so sometimes if we get approached by um, different organizations that really care about that, we can say, well, let's look and see, you know, what are the different health challenges? And so we take all these different um, data layers and then compile them and we find these hotspots. And so we say for, if you were trying to design a, a park just to promote health, these are the areas that would, um, you know, benefit residents most. So this is just one tool. Um, there's a, a a lot of different features in this. Um, we have all this information available and online. Um, we continue to update this. It's available again for public use. We want people to understand their city better, understand how parks can help solve some of those problems. And this is a tool that we use to do that. Does anybody have any questions related to this specifically? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm gonna post the link for the um, PPL GIS, mm -hmm. and I think people can get there mm -hmm. from that part of your website. Okay. Um, yeah, so and we also a have fantastic map. Yeah, we have these maps available um, as well as PDFs. So it, it takes and looks at just health, like I did for the whole city, or it takes connectivity and shows it for the whole city. Um, so we have those and we share those. If you'd like those, I can send them as well. 
So this gets, uh, again, into our, I would say, our, our goal of being sustainable in that we want parks to be strategically placed so they're serving the most people and focusing on the specific issues that areas of our city face, right? So if we are looking at a project in a specific area that, that shows high need for, um, you know, for uh, absorb, um, we'll say, how can this, how can this public park um, help absorb stormwater so that we address some of the localized flooding or address some of the water quality issues, right? And we, we want to then tailor that public space to address that specific need. Um, that way we're getting multiple benefits from it. And it also allows us to, to bring in resources from different areas. So if we're focusing um, a park on health, we want it to promote, you know, health in the community. What other resources do we need to bring into that process to make it successful? And maybe it's a programming aspect. Maybe we don't just need a great public space. We need organizations that talk about healthy eating or that promote physical fitness. And so we need to bring them in. Again, this is just a, a tool to help us be as strategic and successful as possible. Now what I'd love to do is um, share something that we put out last week that um, we think most people would be interested in. It's a report we did. It's called The Heat Is On. This talks about the impact of, of heat on urban environments like ours. Um, obviously, I, I showed you a heat map of the city. There are parts of our city that have um, an experienced urban heat island effect very strongly. And that's where heat builds up during the day and then it stays around at night. It doesn't ever really go away. It's just constantly hotter than other parts of the city. So this report is available on our website, came out last week. Um, and it talks about the way that heat affects um, so many residents. Um, it talks about, you know, not just the, the um, health effects, but also, you know, the economic effects and how over time, um, our policies as a country have kind of created um, some of these problems where, you know, specific areas, specific neighborhoods have experienced um, more intense development. Um, they haven't gotten the benefits of parks. They haven't, you know, had uh, protected places where they can go and, and take breaks or cool off. Um, I won't get into any more of it, but it's a great report. And it's, again, something we use to advocate for investments in parks and public spaces. So what, what our organization nationally does is do the research, they collect the data, they analyze it, and they present it in a way that's really straightforward, it's easy to understand, and it helps us advocate for more investments, especially in areas that have been underinvested in. So uh, I would encourage, you know, everybody take a look at that report. It's a little bit of uh, some light reading, um, but it's free to everybody. And we want, you know, um, you to help promote your city and help, you know, push policymakers to focus on the things that you're interested in. This is what we're interested in. So um, that is um, everything I wanted to kind of present to you but I would love to, to continue to answer questions or um, talk about anything else you're interested in. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we can attach, we can have a link for this report. Um, this is a really excellent report and wanna make sure everybody has access. Is that on um, the TPL website? I'll uh, actually just send it to you. It's, it's embedded in Facebook kind of all over the place. It's tough to get to from our website. So I'll see. Yeah, I, I think I have it oh, downloaded, great. but, uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. So we have, we have a few more questions from folks. Um, and I will, I'm going to stop sharing. If anybody else wants to take over, <laughs> so we can, you could just look at faces. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you stop sharing, it'll just default to, to faces. Um, so yeah, folks, uh, folks would really love to, to help more. Um, so you talked about talking to elected officials. Yes. Do you need volunteers? Uh, someone is mentioning a $400,000 grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and wondering if 
you guys were aware of that grant for putting parks and green spaces in poor neighborhoods. Um, I think it fits. Yeah, it's uh, um, so yeah, folks, folks really want to help. <laughs> That's great. Um, we, we desperately need all the help we can get, um, you know, again, to prioritize these types of investments. So we, we have federal staff that do pursue national grants, including those from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, we have, you know, presented several of our proposed or in process projects to our national uh, staff and they're helping to prioritize those for, you know, bringing national funding into uh, Chattanooga to focus on some of these issues, whether those are, you know, equity um, or whether they're health related, like Robert Wood Johnson tends to focus on. Um, we're, you know, looking for all kinds of funding. Um, more recently, the, the Great American Outdoors Act was um, passed last week. And so that opens up a lot of funding, especially for investments in urban park projects. And in Chattanooga, that's what we're focusing on. We think there's so much opportunity and uh, the need is there as well. Um, but we have to, you know, continue to push, um, you know, for policymakers to, to go after those and to be supportive of these kind of projects. That's great. And do you guys do uh, events from time to time where you need volunteers to maybe pull exotic invasives or help with ongoing care of native plants? I mean, I know that you guys aren't generally in the business of taking care of a place long term, yep. but uh, maybe in the beginning. Yeah, we have limited opportunities for, you know, hands on volunteer support. Um, like you just mentioned, we, our, our role is often as an intermediary. So we are not long-term stewards of property. We find what we call takeout agencies, whether that's a city government or another nonprofit, we work with them. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we typically step back and allow them to manage those properties long-term. Um, I, I can, um, you know, connect with anyone who's interested in that. And we, we certainly do have opportunities for volunteers. They're kind of specialized though. So it's not always hands-on um, planting, but a lot of times what is needed is volunteer monitoring of places um, to make sure that, you know, the management of them is being completed adequately. Great, well, yeah, I guess I would just mention that if anyone is specifically interested in volunteering for city parks, that were that were originally um, uh, rescued or or transferred from trust for public lands to the city. Um, you you could definitely work with me and Anna Mathis on that uh, if you're itching for hands-on work. That's yeah, I actually I reached out to Anna a couple of weeks ago, and I'm trying to to get her to help me with something, and she would be looking for help with those things. So. Great. Um, let's see. So one person a while back, I'm sorry, I skipped over them, was wondering, um, are you in, do you cover North Hamilton County? We don't get much into North Hamilton County because so much of our work is focused on urban areas. And when you get into, into North Hamilton County, the density goes down, um, you know, the housing density. And so those areas um, don't reach, our projects wouldn't reach as many people. Um, we do support Hamilton County uh, occasionally with their work, um, whether that's acquiring or protecting land um, or building parks. We reach out um, regularly, regularly to see what they need from us and we're always available. So we'll, for the most part, we'll work on anything that the community determines is a high priority, right? Because like I said, we don't come in and say, you need these things, you know, at neighborhood of Chattanooga. We wait, and if we hear of a need, then we are there to help promote it and advocate for it and bring in private funding to help, you know, complete, you know, the, the goals of the community. Yeah, I am just, uh, I think, thinking big picture, Trust for Public Land is, is looking at the city as a whole, which I, I feel like a lot of times a city needs that kind of to be to be urged to think about connectivity yep. 
and connecting lands for habitat and people. So that big picture out of the box thinking is, is great. Um, and yes, this was recorded and we will post it. We kind of have a collection uh, accumulating at this point of, of great presentations that you can access at any time. So we're kind of building a library uh, and that will be accessible from the website, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, on our own YouTube channel. So there you go. Um, I feel like I may have missed another question. Oh, um, were you guys involved in the East Lake Park uh, restoration? We were not involved in that project, though we have become involved in the East Lake neighborhood. Um, so we did a study looking at connectivity from Alton Park to East Lake. Um, and as part of that, we were able to secure some funding to do what's called tactical urbanism in and around East Lake Academy and East Lake Park. And that's basically doing short term, medium term interventions to the roadway and the streetscape to help make them more usable by people walking, biking, um, using mobility devices on using strollers. Um, and so we're actually working with a group called Street Plans. They're based out of Miami. Um, they um, take, you know, specific streets and try to reimagine them for, you know, everybody's use. Um, and so we're doing a small project there. Um, we haven't, we haven't really, you know, initiated too much of that yet. That'll be coming later in fall. We can provide information to the group related to the next steps in that. Um, and we also uh, own, currently own a property that's um, right below, it's on the edge of Missionary Ridge that we have, um, we acquired probably 15 years ago. And so that's above East Lake Park. We're trying to uh, find a long-term conservation holder of that. And that's, I've reached out to uh, Lynn's colleagues about um, the city potentially taking that property and just holding it for its own uh, conservation value. We, you know, the, the city has had a discussion more recently about development on steep slopes and floodplains. And we see those as really important um, for our city. Um, and we want to find a way to help conserve some of those places um, and set them aside and say, you know what, we should just keep this as it is. And that's, that provides good value. And so we're trying to think about those things, think about, you know, specifically where is the funding coming to do those kind of activities. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're still working in East Lake. Some of them probably will be for several years. Um, we, we did a family uh, photograph day uh, in East Lake Park. That, this was earlier in the year before COVID hit. Um, and we took some photos of families that were using the park to try to show that the park is for everybody. Public spaces aren't just for one group of people. Um, and to kind of, you know, allow people to, to stake their claim to their public park. And we got some great photographs out of that. I can share that with Lynn as well, the link to that. Um, but it was a, a really easy, fun event. And we thought it, it had a big impact um, for, you know, the amount of time and effort it took us to do it. Great. Um, now we've got folks that really want you to buy up uh, vacant lots and yeah. other properties. Uh, so there's some spots on Missionary Ridge yep. that people would love for you to conserve. Um, here's one from Sandy. There's an old school off Sitico Avenue, now closed and fenced off. A great green area. Um, yeah, Sitico has as kind of an interesting history, and I feel like that community really needs to sure. its history to be highlighted. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to, Lynn, I'm trying to find uh, very quickly some of those photos we had because they, they did, they were great and I'd love to share them. And we do get approached by people about, you know, specific properties or neighborhoods in general where they think, a, you know, a public park would be great. And again, we use the same kind of approach where we look at all the different analyses we have. We look at community need and we, and we start to think, would this be a good spot for a park? So we're always open to talking with people, um, especially when people are advocating for a public park in their neighborhood. 
you know, that's the thing that really drives decision makers to invest, to um, take things seriously is when neighbors say, I need this for my neighborhood. Um, and it, you know, it's funny, I do that, you know, for, for my own street, I, I start to think like, how can I be an advocate for making my street better? And once I get the street better, how do I expand that a little bit? How can we make my neighborhood better? And if every neighborhood did that, our city will make great strides overall and becoming a, you know, just a much better place to live and work uh, and learn. Well, I agree with you. I think it's really important to get neighbors on board and get, get community support. Um, All right, I found the link. Lynn, I'm gonna share this with, uh, I'll tell you what, let me, I'll share it with you and then I would love to do a screen share again so people can see some of our kind of um, more community-based work. So I'm gonna put sure. this link in the chat. Everybody can check this out. And then I'll minimize this. Sorry, I'm talking to myself here. No, it's great. It's happening live. <laughs> screen. So we worked with a, a local photographer to help put this together, as well as a neighbor that helped kind of facilitate everything. Um, this is Daniela, she's the creative placemaking fellow. Um, and this is the neighbor we work with to organize it. So, you know, we tried to schedule uh, families to come in at a set time and that was um, not very successful. But then after we set up this little kiosk and we're basically just telling people walking by what we were doing, they decided that they wanted to have their, their family photo taken. So here's some of the people um, that came into the neighborhood. And, you know, this is, this kind of represents who Eastlake is um, as well. I'm trying to find, um, you know, you've got all, just a lot of diversity in this neighborhood and we want to bring that out and make sure that people feel welcome in the public space, you know, in their, in their neighborhood. So. I'm trying to see if my where's my picture in here you were at the top was i top right uh -huh. oh i got blocked <laughs> over so here here's us oh yep <laughs> uh caveat we do not live in east lake so that was you know um not an east lake resident but it i think everybody else is is either there or connected or working in that neighborhood so this is a great one too Yeah, I, th I think they just showed up. I think they had to go take their dog and put on like an outfit before the photo. So anyway. <laughs> That's great. And it's, you know, it's so important to, to remind people, you know, I mean, connecting people with nature. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think about how much they cherish a place. But looking at these photos, um, feel a greater connection with that with that yeah. space. So that's something we're trying to replicate in other, in other parks as well, because it is a very quick intervention, low cost, but again, it, it was a, I think everybody that participated <laughs> thought it was great. It's my son laughing at me. Felix thought it was great. He did. <laughs> All right, well, we've got some discussion about uh, a new, um, yeah, they're going to connect. We're going to connect uh, Missionary Ridge to South Chattanooga and um, preserve all those steep slopes. It's going to be it's going to be a beautiful dream for now, but uh, maybe one day we can get there. Yeah, Missionary Ridge is the tough one. There's there's so few there you know places that you can go through it. Right, you're basically looking at a tunnel. Um, and going over it is just such a challenge too. It's, it's very steep topography. And so to make it, you know, usable by everybody, unless you're, you know, very um, kind of well-trained cyclist or you're, you're a hiker, you, you can go up those things. It's just really difficult. So, yeah, you know, we're absolutely. looking at that. Well, I, I hope I didn't miss any other questions. I feel like we've slowed down a little bit here. Um, and we're just about at seven o'clock. Um, so yeah, if there's any last questions or if anybody needs to speak out, if I missed you, 
Um, yeah, I guess I'll just say uh, thank you, David. Thank you so much sure. for the work you do. Thanks for coming out and speaking with us tonight. Um, people are are praising TPL in the in the chat box and uh, for. And yeah, I'll just echo what Lisa said. We're really lucky to have a regional office in our city. And mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's really fantastic. And um, I agree 100%. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And I, I hope Wild Ones and TPL can, uh, can yeah, keep, keep in the loop and keep helping each other out. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you a little bit. I'm sorry I talk so much. I get excited about these things because this is like what I do um, and what I want for my own neighborhood and city. So I put my email address in there. If you got any questions, concerns, if you figure out the best place to cross over Missionary Ridge, I'm looking for that. So just email me. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll have this recorded and copy those links, folks. Thanks so much for coming out, everybody.